Welcome everyone, good evening. Uh, my name is Luis Fraga, and together with ILS co-director Timothy Matovina, Tim, where are you? Uh, he will be here shortly. Um, on behalf of the Institute for Latino Studies, we're uh, very pleased to welcome you, and even uh, more pleased, if you'll permit me, to welcome our guest speaker uh, this evening. As some of you know, the purpose of our transformative Latino lecture series is to bring prominent national and regional figures to Notre Dame and to the South Bend community so that we all have an opportunity to learn from individuals who have had very significant leadership responsibilities and, as is the case with our guest for today, individuals who have had incredible success. Every once in a while, you have the opportunity to actually meet one of your heroes. I had the opportunity to first learn about our invited speaker, Gloria Molina, when I, about 10 years ago, started to do research on Latinas in American politics. And as one Googles Latinas in American politics, and one Googles influential and successful Latinas in American politics. Actually, if one Googles powerhouses in Latino politics, the name of Gloria Molina appears. Gloria Molina grew up as one of 10 children in the Los Angeles suburb of Pico Rivera in California. Her father was Mexican American. Her mother was from Mexico. She attended Rio Hondo College, East Los Angeles College, and California State University, Los Angeles. Ms. Molina is a person of firsts. She was the first Latina to ever be elected to the California State Assembly in 1982. She was the first Latina to ever be elected to the Los Angeles City Council in 1987. And in 1991, she was again the first Latina to ever be elected to the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. She is a person who has broken glass ceilings. She is a trailblazer to a very, very significant degree. Here at Notre Dame, we say that um, we are blessed. We're blessed to be part of a wonderful institution. We are blessed in the springtime to be in South Bend. That's a joke. <laughs> um, but today, I feel especially blessed that we have Gloria Molina here with us. And I want to tell you why. I've had the privilege of being with her yesterday evening and all day today. And to see her interacting with different individuals and interacting with um, students, our students here from Notre Dame, she'll have the opportunity to interact with many of our students who are here as guests from Adams High School. How about a shout out for Adams High School? And I've seen why she's been so successful. She's successful because she listens. She's successful because she's self-reflective. She's successful because she's, as you'll see and hear, strong and clear in her principles. But she's successful primarily because she has committed her life to empowering all communities with a specific focus on empowering our Latino communities. Please join me in welcoming as our spring guest to the Transformative Latino Leadership Lecture Series Assembly member, council member, and supervisor, Gloria Molina. So the way we're going to do this is that I'm going to engage in conversation with, uh, with Ms. Molina. We're going to do that for about 40 minutes, and then there will be a full 20 minutes at the end for questions. So get your questions ready um, so that she'll have an opportunity to interact with you. Gloria, is there anything you'd like to say at the beginning? Well, first of all, I've had a wonderful day. I've never been to Notre Dame. Uh, I've known Gil, and we talked about it from time to time. I said, what are you doing in Notre Dame? Uh, so it's a fascinating. Uh, I've had a tour of the campus, and I've met with wonderful students. So I really have enjoyed my day. I thank you so much for it. A real good experience. Very positive. Great. 
Linda, could you tell us uh, about where you grew up and what your neighborhood was like and what your family life was like growing up? Well, I'm the oldest of ten, as was mentioned. Uh, my parents basically are from Mexico. My dad was born in Los Angeles, but he was sent to Casas Grandes, Chihuahua, where he was raised by, by his aunt and his uncle. And so I grew up in a very traditional Mexican household. My father did not want my mother to work, even though she probably could have, if we would have benefited from the, from the salary that she might have been able to bring. And of course, she had to stay home and take care of all the rest of us. I was totally Spanish speaking as I entered school. Um, which was a, a difficult thing, I think, for the teachers, not so much for myself. I, I got along and I uh, just didn't need to talk to anyone for until about the third grade. I finally picked up some, some of my language skills. Um, but anyway, grew up in a very, very traditional household in a barrio that is called Simons, which is outside, right outside of East L.A. in, in Montebello, part of the Simons Brickyard. Uh, an a old-fashioned company town, and it was about it where everybody spoke Spanish, and all the neighbors, we all knew each other, and it was a small little barrio, until I went to school, and I realized, my God, it's a whole different uh, environment, uh, and so on. But anyway, uh, very traditional. My parents were just so grateful that I graduated from, from high school. Uh, my mother felt very strongly that, uh, that I should go to work right after high school to help the family financially. There was quite a quite a responsibility to that. So I didn't get to go through the traditional college route that many of you are going to get to enjoy and hopefully many of you in high school will be a part of. Um, and so my upbringing was very, very traditional, although um, for me, I realized very early that uh, I didn't want to follow a traditional pattern. My parents had expectations that I would work for a while, meet somebody, get married, and have a lot of children, as they did. And that's not what I wanted to do. I felt very strongly about being strong and independent. Uh, I get that from my grandmother. Um, and so, uh, but somehow there was just an interest in working in the community, working on issues. So, of course, I had to make a living, and, and I worked as a legal secretary for a number of years. And um, I was telling the students earlier that, well, I had an opportunity to work in the White House. I worked at the Carter White House. And um, when coming home and visiting with my family, my dad took me aside. And I was, what, 27, 28 years old and successful in, in the work I was doing. And he sat me down and had a very serious discussion and was very concerned that I should get married. Uh, that, you know, it's time and you're going to be a 30-year-old very soon <laughs> and you're not married. And I said, Pop, I'm doing fine. I said, you know, I've got, I'm working at the White House. I have my own condominium there. I'm, I'm successful and, and I don't necessarily need a man to take care of me. But again, my father being very concerned, he goes, family is everything. Again, following in those kinds of traditions. So he was grateful that I finally did get married, but it, it didn't happen until I was 37 years old. Uh, so I had a very traditional upbringing and, and, uh, and then sort of challenged um, a lot of those traditions as we were moving into a Chicano movement and moving into a feminist movement, which were a very important part of, of my, my early 20s. You, early on, you became very much involved in community organizing. And you were in community organizing before you first decided to run for elective office. Oh, absolutely. Um, how many years, what type of organizing did you do? I know that you were one of the individuals responsible for the establishment of the Comisión Femenil Mexicana Nacional. You could talk to us a little bit about that community organizing background. Right. I was working as a legal secretary, but I was a, a consummate volunteer. Uh, when a lot of people ask me, how did you meet up and decide to do these things. I, was, I volunteered for everything. Um, and so um, in that effort, I, I was working with young women. I was a, started out as a tutor in the Maravilla Projects. And I realized very early that these girls who were 10th graders could not read. And I'm going, you know, how did you get to the 10th grade and not be able to read? I was very concerned about it. And I went and visited with the school and the teachers and the, the spoke with one of the teachers that had quite an attitude about these young women. Uh, sort of said, well, you know, these girls are just not going to finish high school. Um, you know, they're, they're going to probably have a, a child out of wedlock. And it just, just had all the negative stereotypes just laid on these young girls. And it bothered me tremendously that she could be a teacher that would be teaching at Garfield High School. 
So um, that prompted me to some activism, and I'm saying this is something we need to change. And of course, while I was going, even though I was going to school at night, as I mentioned to people, I um, joined as an activist. I we belonged to the student organization before it was called Mecha. It was called MASA, the Mexican American Student Association, and we were activists there. Not a, not a leader, but a follower. So uh, you know, I was accustomed to. I wanted to get involved in many of those issues. But it was, what was really concerned me at the time was that in the Chicano movement, which was very important to me, and we were, in, and we were also involved in the war against Vietnam, and because the Chicanos were being sent to the front lines. By the way, I use Chicano, I'm very proud of Chicana, but I use Hispanic, Latina, so you'll get accustomed to I, I drop all of these, these things as far as identity, but I consider myself a Chicana. Part of the Chicano movement was a very sexist movement. Uh, the women were relegated to making the menudo for fundraising, and we were relegated to, at that time, mimeographing all of the posters and everything that we used to pass out. And then, but there was also the feminist movement was starting up at that time. And I attended a lot of the consciousness raising discussions that feminists were having on the other side of town. And I also, I found that while the Latinos were very, very sexist, the feminist movement at that time was really still rather racist. I mean, they talk about white women's empowerment for the most part, not necessarily, and talk and use words that I found derogatory to me, like they said the macho men and the macho men. And to me, my father was a very proud macho. He looked at that word very differently than what's interpreted by feminists. He looked at it as a positive word, a word of being a responsible man and, and being responsible for his children and their upbringing and, and a responsible husband. And so it was hard and harsh for me to participate. But at the same time, they were both very significant movements and they were doing a lot of wonderful work. So we dealt with the sexism and we dealt with the racism. But eventually we said, let's organize Chicanas, Latinas, and let's do our own to let everybody know that we got to get rid of both of these barriers of sexism and racism and, and start empowering ourselves. So we started organizing and, and creating programming for Latinas. The interest was unbelievable. We attracted, we created, a, there was a group of women who had already created Comisión Femenil, but I created, well, I was a part of founding an organization and a membership organization and bringing women together and having these dialogues, putting into action some of the things that we wanted to do. Latinas were facing the problems of certainly not only finding employment because they needed to be working and there were, many of them were working moms. So getting opportunities for employment. Uh, so we created the Chicano Service Action Center, which was an employment training program. And of course, when women go to work, when Chicanos go to work, particularly single moms, they need childcare. And so we developed the first bilingual bicultural child care center as well. The supportive services that women needed in order to really meet the economic needs of their families. So we started organizing, was very involved in that, and it's something I did. Eventually it became political organizing, voter registration organizing, and before you knew it we were volunteers all over, and really trying to engage our community to have, to be involved in, the, in, in voting and to start making change and making positive change. So I was very involved in organizing very, very early in, in, in my life, and that led to, of course, realizing how bad things were and, and, and had been an outsider of this system. In other words, a critic, uh, um, a marcher, a protester, a walk thrower, uh, in a set, in, not just, not no, literally, not literally. <laughs> but, uh, I'm chicken hearted at, 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 at heart, actually, I wouldn't be trying to do that. But at the same time, I, act, I would actively participate in the Chicago Moratorium and in marches that we did as feminists and so on. So we're actively involved in all of that. Um, and so uh, I am reflecting now that we attended the first international women's conference and was in Houston a year and that way back then as, as young we organized Chicanas to say we're going to participate in this, we're getting that whole bunch of us are going to gather enough money to fly ourselves there and to be an active part of it because we wanted to make sure they adopted principles that were important and initiatives that were important to many of us as Latinas in this country. But um, so that kind of, that was my, my activism, that's how I organized, and I think I've been doing it all my life ever since. It's a natural thing, even now as a retired lady, I have to be involved in something. I, I'm organizing right now, hopefully putting together a Latina leadership program for Whittier College. Um, I am looking at organizing a program to create mentors, women like myself, that are 
fortunate to, to be retired and able-bodied to create a mentoring program for Latino moms, helping their children who get through school and get on to college. You know, everything from learning how to read a report card and how to make sure that the kids are reading at grade level and demystifying the educational system for them and being kind of a big sister or a supportive person. So I'm organizing that program uh, that I will be um, engaging in very, very soon. And, and of course, I'm, at, at heart, uh, I'm a quilter, so I've organized even Chicanas to get involved in the world of quilting, which is a very traditional American art, and we're bringing our own Latino kind of spin to it. So I'm still organizing. It's, it's interesting. I don't know why I do that, but I enjoy it. And it's worthwhile. And I also love to see women feeling empowered and independent. I love having female friends. I think it's one of my most cherished relationships are with my, my friends that I've had forever and are active. Uh, and I just think it's, a, it's a, a healthy thing to be a part of a community and a dialogue all of the time with like-minded people and talking about challenging ourselves to do something in our community to bring about good change, positive change. You were the first Latino to get elected to the California State Assembly, so you made a decision after years of organizing right. to run for elective office. Now, running for elective office isn't easy, as we all know. You subject yourself to tremendous amounts of scrutiny, you have to raise money, you have to put together coalitions, you oftentimes have opponents who have as their primary goal making sure that you're defeated. Um, why did you decide to run for elective office? And what perspective and voice did you want to bring? And what was that like well, in your first campaign? My goal wasn't for myself to run. My goal was to get the first Mexican-American woman into the U.S. Congress. That was my goal. At that time, we did not have one Latina at all from, uh, from anywhere in the country that was serving in the U.S. Congress. So we had a reapportionment uh, opportunity after our census in, in 1980, where we had two congressional seats available that came into that were local <coughs> seats. So of course, we went to the powers that be. They were in our backyard, in one in East LA, and the other one in the San Gabriel Valley, both heavily Latino districts that we went to them and, and said, well, how, what a great opportunity. We, we now could run a male and a female, uh, Latina, Latino, to run for these seats. And of course, we're dismayed to find out that the very men that we had been supporting all these years in different campaigns of volunteers all of a sudden decided that, no, they had already decided who was going to run. It was two men. And, you know, we'll call on you when we need a woman to run for office. At that time, it was very discouraging because we had been supportive of them. We had been gathering and been volunteers in their campaigns, and, and uh, we were very effective in recruiting volunteers that we thought there would be kind of a mutual support by now. But lo and behold, sexism continued to flare up in our own community. So, um, but I still, we still had the goal. And I always saw myself as a political um, campaign consultant. I'm the fundraiser, I'm the manager. Um, as people who know me, they know that sometimes I'm not politically correct enough to be a politician. I, I have strong opinions. <coughs> sometimes I'm not politically correct in what I say and do. And so I didn't think I would be the best candidate. And so I went looking for a candidate, and at the end of the day, um, our tourist, who was, a, who was that time was going to run for the Senate seat, said, no, I only will go if you, I can support you. The guys have already decided who their candidate is, and I'll only support you, no one else. So I was able to, to just, I, at that time, we went back and said, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person to run. But even as we went out and looked for other Latina, particularly lawyers, who we thought had the credentials to run for that seat, they too were nervous about running. They said, no, the guys are never going to let us run, and they're going to beat us, and I, we're not going to, you know, go out there and, and take such a risk. So I decided to run for that seat at that time, and, and uh, we put together a campaign. I, I'm not to say we put a campaign together. To, we wanted to win. But the most important thing to us is that we wanted a good, effective campaign. We needed to show the men in the community that we were capable of organizing, that we had the opportunity to raise money, that we could get the support in the community, that we could do these things. And we knew it was an uphill battle because they had everything going for them. And, and we were going to be a totally volunteer, not have as much money, not have the endorsements, not have the natural kind of support that one would have. And, uh, but we outworked them. We had more volunteers than they did, so we didn't need as much money as they, as they had. 
Uh, so we were able to, to do it. I walked the district one and one half time talking to voters. A lot of skeptics saying, I'm not going to support you, you're, you're a woman, they're not going to take you seriously. Sexism was rampant throughout. Nobody trusted many of us in these positions. Not that women weren't elected, but a Chicana had never been elected, or Latina had not been elected. So we had a lot of work to convince our community, and so I ended up um, winning that seat in 1982. I ran against their candidate, and, uh, and uh, we beat him. Um, made a lot of people unhappy because I joined the legislature. Of course, all of the members of the legislature, except for many of the women there, had supported my, my, my uh, opposition as compared to myself. So I wasn't really welcomed the first day I got there, but I ended up having a great, um, building a great coalition of, of people and doing some good things when I was in the legislature. And I've enjoyed being elected, still not politically correct all the time, not a great, even had a problem using the word politician. It's always been such a negative term for me. That, but I'm now comfortable with it because I think I've served it well and, and have done a good job and, and I'm proud of the work and the contribution I've made. Did you face any gender related challenges, challenges as a woman when you were in the state assembly? Every day, ongoing, all the time. Um, I was telling the students earlier that on um, one of the first days that I arrived, my colleague, who's a wonderful gentleman who went on to serve in Congress, he was my, not my seatmate, but he sat right behind me, and he welcomed me and he said, how great to have you here. We were now we have somebody who's going to be involved in bilingual education and child care. And I thought, been already stereotyped and relegated to my corner. I mean, you know, I'm interested in other issues and so on. And uh, it's interesting, I told him about a year later when I finally had the courage to say to him how offensive that remark was and how it, it was, you know, again, very racist and very sexist because I came here and I had equal standing with him and I was had an opportunity to participate in a whole range of issues and, and to be, I was not going to accept being relegated to this corner, not that bilingual education and child care were not important to me, but I was going to allow him to stereotype me and put me in that corner. And so it happened all of the time. We, there were constant, and it still happens today, it, it's not over, it just isn't over. Uh, but you can't walk around with a chip on your shoulder uh, because there is still sexism and racism that exists and it's displayed in different um, manners and ways. So even as an elected official, uh, I have been challenged in that regard. And, and like I said, you have to pick your fights. You, you cannot, and you can't dwell on it. You can't walk around and say, oh, you know, I can't do anything because they discriminate against me. Or they, I leave that all behind. I'm not going to allow anyone to intimidate me or put me in my place. I got elected. I have equal footing with my colleagues. They may not think so, but I challenge them on a regular basis all of the time. I have to work twice as hard to be equal, I say, but that's okay. I'm, I'm prepared for it, and that's what I've been doing. And it has led to my having the kind of opportunities that I had. And the other part of it is being a first is a responsibility and a duty to your community. And for women and for Latinos and for Latinas. When you're the first, you have to set the example, which is what my mother said to me. And uh, and so, you know, people are watching you and, and they're wanting to know if you're going to be effective or not. And if you're not effective, you're not gonna be able to open that door for others uh, in a way that you need to do. So people look to you to, um, to see what you're doing and how capable you are. So I was being challenged all of the time. It was a brand new experience for me being up there and being a policy maker. But at the end of the day, it was a very important role and a, an important duty and responsibility um, in serving as a legislator. But dealing with sexism and racism is part of the norm. When you're in politics, you often have to make compromises and see what kind of deals you can cut. Would you tell us the story that you shared with a number of us earlier about the time that you worked in the California State Legislature to get uh, legislation enacted that dealt with dropouts mm -hmm. and how that intersected with the desire of other people in the California State Legislature to uh, establish a prison right. in your district and how that circumstance worked out? One of the priorities when I joined the legislature, when you think about, you know, here I am going to have an opportunity to write legislation and to change, and what did I want to change? I really wanted to change 
um, high school dropout rates for, for Latinos and for all kids. And so I did some study bills, we worked on some issues, we did a lot of research, and I put together about 10 legislative bills that were um, focused on making the schools much more accountable to graduating all of their students. Uh, they sort of tossed it around, everybody accepted the fact that so many kids dropped out and that was their problem, and that was their parents' problem, not the school's problem. So I did an awful lot of legislation, a lot of work working with the college, with the junior colleges, and things of that sort. Anyway, to get kids to at least a baseline of education, which was high school diploma. And I authored some bills, and that they were very good. In fact, they were so good that I got called into the speaker's office one day, and he said, Gloria, I'm taking away these, these four or five bills. And I said, why? And he was, well, I've got to give them to your colleagues. A lot of them just don't, you know, do the elbow work to get their some thing, good things in place, and they need good legislation. So I like your bills, so they're going to author them. So my name was removed from them. And, you know, it was not a battle worth dealing with. I was more interested in the legislation than I was having my name on it. Um, but And then later on I told people I had to work and help them because they weren't smart enough or worked hard enough to get the bills passed, and so I had to do that. Um, but it had their name on it because they just, they needed it. So all ten bills passed. They had by length, they had, um, um, what do they call it, they, uh, both the party, both the uh, party support. Bipartisan support, excuse me, I lost the word. Bipartisan support did very well. I created strategies because there were a lot of people who looked at the dropout rate and said, oh, well, you know, that's a minority problem. It's our African American community and it's Latinos that don't graduate. I went around to every district and I collected data in each of these assembly members' districts to let them know what their high school dropout rate was. And they were shocked because it was across the board. It was a problem that was going on across the state of California. And once I got them interested in the issue, it was easier to pass and, and get the legislation through. So I was very, very successful in that regard. And patted myself on the back and my staff. We did a great job. So I get invited to the governor's office one day, and here I am, like everyone, having the expectation that I'm going to get a couple of pins, that he's going to sign my legislation. We're going to take some pictures. I'm going to go home and show everybody back at home, and all my bills will be signed into law. Instead, um, during that time, the governor, the Republican governor, and my colleagues in the legislature were looking for a place to site a state prison. We needed to build another state prison. So I guess they had looked at it and concluded that why not Gloria Molina's district? You know, it's got the lowest voters registration and, you know, and so on. Um, and they said a couple of insulting things. I'm sure they told me later that, you know, it would be close for, for their neighborhood to visit their loved ones. But when they said that they were going to put a prison in my backyard, I just wouldn't accept it. That was not acceptable to me. And I challenged my colleagues, my Democratic colleagues, and I challenged the governor every step of the way that I would not accept a prison. And I fought it. And I did very successfully fight it in committee <coughs> and in the legislature. So it wasn't passing. So the governor, when he called me in, he placed a, a, a legal uh, tablet in front of me, a yellow tablet, and said, um, which of your bills would you like me to sign? <coughs> and of course I talked to him and I said they received my, my bipartisan support. They, they passed out unanimously. I'd love you to support us to sign all of them. I didn't see a problem with any of them. He goes, oh no, they're wonderful bills and, and we could do that. <coughs> but I need you to take a prison in East LA. And I left there with all of my bills being vetoed. And, but at least I walked out with the dignity that I was not going to allow my community down by putting another prison in East L.A. And so it was quite a battle, quite a, <coughs> you can compromise on certain things, <coughs> excuse me, but there's a point in time that you can't compromise. And for me, I couldn't compromise because I, and, and my community was very proud, even though we lost all of those bills, which were very important. And my staff was very disappointed because they had done all of that work. But you have to be true to yourself and true to the interest of your community. And uh, we were just not going to accept a prison in East LA. We didn't need another negative project like that. Nobody wanted it in their district. And I just wasn't going to allow them to make a decision without even asking uh, to put it in my district. And even if they would have asked, I wouldn't have accepted. So 
that was my battle then. It taught, I learned an awful lot from it. It was a real struggle. Um, but at the end of the day, we won. Uh, they continued to pursue it. They not only vetoed my legislation, they worked very hard at trying to get the votes to put a prison in East LA. Um, and every so often they would beat me and then I'd find a way to fight back and, and uh, kick it back. And today, I'm very proud that in East Los Angeles, we do not have a state prison, even today, 20, 30 years later. So proud of that. <laughs> so you served in three different levels of government, right? The state assembly, and then the city council, and the county board of supervisors. Which one? In which one did you think you had the greatest impact? And which one provided you with a type of work and a set of issues that you found most interesting? Well, certainly in the legislature was very interesting, and being the first there was very important, and setting the example was very important. But, you know, you're a policymaker, you, you pass legislation, you don't get involved in implementing legislation, you don't even get involved in overseeing legislation. Every year there's a cycle, you're introducing bills, you're being lobbied, and so on. And it was a great experience, I'm not going to deny it, it was a first for me. Um, but when there was an opportunity to run for the city council, again, a tough one because the guys organized a campaign against me, and I were one of their against one of their the male uh, candidate that they had. But we, of course, were in a better position. Uh, you know, they don't learn. I don't know why they're so stubborn. They just don't learn. And uh, so I ran for the city council, and it was really interesting because I love being home and being close to people and being in touch with constituents and getting to listen to people. Uh, but the issues were not as interesting. You're dealing with, you know, land use issues and some issues in dealing with, with the police and things of that sort. And so there was interesting issues. I got involved in affordable housing because at least that was a policy goal that I had and got involved in that. And I served there for a while. But then certainly when I had an opportunity to run, by the way, I didn't just get anointed at that time either. I ran against 11 other candidates, but I had built a good reputation in my district and had a good uh, grassroots uh, campaign still, volunteers and so on. I ran against 11 others and when I was elected in 1991, after a fierce battle uh, that Maldeth had undertaken to get to carve out a district that would have an opportunity district, that is for a group of Latinos to come together because there had been a lot of dis political discrimination so that we didn't even have an opportunity to run for that seat. Uh, I was I was elected, and that by far was the most interesting opportunity that I had because it dealt with everything that I enjoy. Not only do you get to legislate, but you're also an executive, so you're managing and monitoring the departments as you get to see those policies implemented. And then, of course, you're responsible for the budgeting of those issues, those things. So you have to have the money to run those programs and to create and, and to follow through on it. You don't just legislate, put it on the books, and hey, somebody else figure out how, how to implement it. So I love the range of issues, and I got to work on children's issues and mental health issues that were important to me, health care, still dealing with, with security issues, the sheriff, quality of life issues that were important, but even libraries and parks that are important and very dear to me, because that was, certainly when I was growing up, that was where I studied and, and where I got to play. When you're an uh, oldest of 10 and there's a lot of people in your home, you don't have a, a whole lot of play area. You don't have places you can study. So uh, libraries and, and parks have always been very, very unique and special to me. So that, I love working as a board of supervisors. And I would love to have continued, but at the same time, they did have term, they introduced term limits. And so that I ran out of time. And um, uh, But that's OK as well. Um, I needed to move on, and we needed to bring new leadership to, to those positions. So your career and your life was driven in part by trying to bring a woman's voice mm -hmm. to the political process. Yes. Do Latinas make better elected officials than Latinos? And if so, why? In my opinion, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you why. I think that, that men in our community are brought up so much differently than the women in our community. And um, I think that we bring a, a, a part of us that is different. The men in our community are brought up to be the macho man, okay, the responsible man, and so on. But, but again, they have, there's still a lot of sexism that goes on, and they operate very singularly. 
I am the legislator, I am the elected official. Women operate with the we, and much more inclusive, much more bringing people together, much more of a collaborative kind of thing, like, like a mom, like a family coming together. Um, so we bring that, we bring a, a cultural advantage that I think is, is significant as you legislate, as you build coalitions. Uh, so we're much more effective at it. I'm not going to say that that's true across the board. I'm just saying it's generalities. Not as much ego. In fact, sometimes we have to really kick women to have a little bit more ego because sometimes it's important to say, I did this. I, you know, I was a part of that. And we have a tendency to, be, to take a back seat to some of that. Um, so that we bring a really unique perspective to, um, to the political process that I think is a welcome one. Uh, when I look at the statistics and, and what's going on in this country, uh, that's why I was so welcome to come here and I was very interested when Professor Fraga invited me here because this issue of leadership is so significantly important to all of us, not just the Latino community, but to all of us. The reality of the Latino demographics as you play them out and project them into the future there are various scenarios that can operate. We are certainly going to be the majority population, and you know, 50 years, one in three will be Latino uh, in this country, and so we're going to play a very significant role. And the worst thing that can happen is that we are not prepared for the potential of leadership positions that we're going to have to take on and be responsible for. So we need to prepare ourselves for those leadership duties and responsibilities that we undertake. And I'm not, we're not talking about, and so I think that the power that we have uh, once you're elected is a very, very significant thing. And you have to be so careful with power. Um, you can misuse <coughs> power, as we're seeing in some places, in Congress and White House. Uh, and, uh, that scares me. Uh, and so you have to be, you have to nurture it, you have to take care of it, you have to be careful with power, you have to use it well. Uh, and so I think women bring that, bring something different. It isn't just about así no más, you know, it's about thinking it out and working it out. And women have a different approach, and I found that to be a cross board. Now, I'm not saying that with some of us are just not in your face. We do things, we do, including myself. But I do think we bring a different perspective. I started out with the feeling that women had to be at the table making these decisions and on an equal footing with men. That if we, were, we wanted our Latino men to be at the table making policy decisions in the legislature and the US Congress, but women had to be at the table too because we needed that equal footing. As I've been watching women and I've been watching Latino men and how they operate politically, I have concluded that women bring some additional value to, to politics, to, to the issues of power. And not an, an absolute, I'm just saying generally. And I think a lot of it comes from our traditions and who we are as Latinas and how we operate and, and which, like I said, we're more inclusive where we look at la familia and we're comadres and we want everyone to be a part of it. We don't have to be a Latino to be part of our, our familia. We welcome all of that. And so I think it's a very, very unique perspective that we offer and we should be proud of it. You have this incredible faith in the political process. I do. You have an incredible um, sense of hope and promise in how our political institutions work. Do you still have that given the nature of our politics today and given the nature of leadership that we're getting in the national government today? And if so, why? Well, I'm very optimistic about our community and optimistic about our future. Uh, when I look at the young people and the growth of in, in our, um, our young people and, and the work that I hope to do that you're doing today, there's tremendous promise for our future. Um, uh, I am, it's, it's amazing, and, and even today, the introduction to so many of the students and having a dialogue with them was only a reinforcement of how positive that is. Um, I, I, I have believed, I mean, I played outside of the system and as part of the Chicano Moratorium in East L.A. and marching uh, and was part of women's marches and, and just marched recently in the Women's March in L.A. and 
a couple of weeks ago in the, in the uh, immigration march that we did. Um, and so, and I will continue to do that. I've been critical. I continue to criticize. I write my letters to members of Congress. I speak to them as honestly as I can about some of the points of view that I dislike. Uh, but um, I really have, I know that the system can work for us if you learn how to use it. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be easy out there because I'm as I serve on MALDEF, which is, I love that it's so important. These are the Latino lawyers for our community, that they have the capability and the strength and we need to raise money for them all the time because we still need to fight all the way to the Supreme Court on our issues because things are just not equal yet. We have a long way to go. Uh, but I'm optimistic because we're not going to win everything, but we're doing better. And our community is strong, and we're going to be here for a long time. And we bring something very positive to, to, to politics. So I always share with people that let's just get involved. Let's get in there and change it. I'm, my own Democratic Party disappoints me from time to time, but I'm a very loyal Democrat. I can just turn around and criticize it, kick it around and say that. But instead, I'd like to be involved in bringing about positive change within my party. It's going to need to change if it's going to face its future. And so it needs to figure out where it's going, how it's going to start re-engaging young people, re-engaging the working families and those kinds of things. So, but I feel very strong. We have a good system. We are a powerful system. And I am hoping that, you know, as we continue to grow as a Latino community, that we're going to be looked upon as people who aren't exclusively going to be in positions of power for exclusively Latino issues. Well, if you look at the work that we do, my work, members of Congress that you may or may not know, you look at someone like Javier Becerra, who's in Congress, Bian Castro that is there, if you listen to them speak on these issues, and many of them, Linda Sanchez was on CNN this morning talking about um, the Affordable Care Act. They are smart, capable, and they know how to address all of these issues. They are legislating and governing for everyone. And their skill set is strong and capable. So uh, I'm proud, and I, my identity is very important to me as a Latina. And, and there are issues in my community that I'm going to advance forward as I move forward. But at the end of the day, when you're elected, as I was, I represented 2 million people on the Board of Supervisors. The county is 10 million people. There are five of us. So I represented 2 million people. And not all of them, of course, not all of them were Latino. Uh, but the reality, and not all of them voted for me. And not all of them liked me. But at the end of the day, my job was to represent their interests, to listen to them and to make sure that I made every effort to outreach to them and, and to re represent them. I didn't agree with all of them all the time, and we had to agree to disagree. But at the end of the day, my duty was. And so I have tremendous confidence in our political system. It has its peaks and valleys. And I remember when I took my political science class, when I was in, in college, you know, the teacher talked about this, you know, how the swinging left and right, that's a natural, I said, that's impossible. I just couldn't imagine it to be swinging at a more conservative than when I was, you know, in, in my, you know, 18 and 19 year old. And, um, but then sure enough, there was Nixon got elected. I'm like, what? <laughs> so it happens. And of course, it's, it's been doing that ever since. And so we have to have confidence and, and build on the system. And, uh, and just not be someone that's outsider. But our responsibility politically is to challenge ourselves every single day to be a part of the system. Even though you're not running for office, working for a politician, being a part of the political system, we are voters. And it's very essential that we understand we're voters and we have to be responsible voters. Not the cheat sheet voters. You know, you get your papelito or your paper on, on election day and then tells you, okay, this is what my union is doing. So I'm You've got to challenge yourself to figure out who the good candidates are, what the issues are, what your positions are, attend candidate forums, and do those kinds of things to become responsible. That's why I have confidence, because if you work it, if you learn it, if you know how to challenge it and strategize for it, uh, we have the capability of fitting into all those leadership roles for the future. We've got to prepare ourselves, we have to help each other, we've got to mentor each other, and move forward. You have held national positions and um, campaigns, and you've been an influential member of the Democratic Party. Um, if we take our, for many of us, our home state of Indiana, where the Republican Party is and the 
governor's mansion, the Republican Party is the majority party in the state senate, the Republican Party is the majority party in the House of Representatives. Um, it's not just in Indiana, it's in 33 of the 50 states in the United States. What advice do you have for your Democratic Party as to how it can do better? Well, first of all, it has to do better. But we need to challenge ourselves. Keep in mind, I'm from the state of California. California has not always been a liberal state as it is today. I mean, this is a state that passed 187. 187 was a measure that was totally anti-immigrant. Uh, where they were going to allow ICE to go into our schools, they were going to deputize, um, you know, social workers, they were going to deputize um, um, teachers, that everybody was going to be looking out for illegals and, and reporting them. Um, and it passed in the state of California. Uh, I am a state that elected Arnold Schwarzenegger to be governor. I mean, come on, so we weren't always... It was now fired. <laughs> We fired her for no. But uh, anyway, yeah, I'm not on the, I guess, the apprentice anymore. But the point is, is that we had to work during those low times. We were able to beat 187 because Maldef was prepared to fight it and win uh, on legally on that issue. But that that we were organizing. We have been part of continuing to. All right, we needed to change in California. Now, of course, it's been a very good change. We're now a democratic state, but we weren't always there. But my party has a long way to go. I have watched my party become a party that, re regrettably, I know it can raise a lot of money, and I should be proud of that, but I think it listens too much to the special interests, more than I would like them to do. I think that sometimes, well, again, I I'm, uh, come out of a collective bargaining family. I don't buy everything that labor unions say. I think we have to maintain a strong independent voice. We have to listen to people. Certainly it hasn't been talking to young people. Um, they are not identifying as much as, I mean, automatically many of us just felt that was our party. So we have, the party has to learn a lot. And certainly it, it, in Indiana, I would not despair uh, completely because you have pockets of great vitality and, and great democratic, I mean, South Bend just had a, a mayor that was recently hoping to become national democratic chair and, and, and there were a lot of support for him and, and good for him. Um, but again, he didn't win and Tomas Perez won, which I was very proud of as well. But hopefully he's going to be a part of bringing his leadership, the issues that he has, to the party, and hopefully the mass and the new leadership of the Democratic Party are going to be smart enough to listen to him uh, and incorporate uh, what he has to say and what he wants to do and his vision. Uh, and then they're going to have to go back out there. They've got to go to the rural parts of our, our country, our states, and, uh, and, and reintroduce themselves and, uh, and talk to neighborhoods and communities and invigorate those communities and target and do all the planning that needs to be done to looking at those marginal districts where Democrats have a fighting chance, find the right candidates and look for minority candidates, look for candidates from that community and support them and, and arm them with the skill set and the resources they need to get elected. Uh, my party has to listen for a while, has to regroup, it has to move forward. Um, I don't know if it's going to be totally successful in reinventing itself. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, but, you know, the, he, even Bernie Sanders is not sure if he's interested in still associating with the Democratic Party. In an interview that he did recently, they asked him, are you going to share the names? Are you going to share the financial support you got? Are you going to do that? And he was hesitant to say yes. So he, they had to convince him to, to come and join and really be a Democrat and be a part of that party. I hope it does repair itself because I think that that, that is our pathway to the kind of success, at least I'm, again, a very partisan Democrat, success in moving forward on, on civil rights issues, the protections that we need uh, in order to advance opportunity in, in this country, um, the protections that we need for the LGBT community, the opportunities that we as women need, in order to achieve the kind of equality that we need and the opportunity that we must have. So um, I'm hoping my party will, will tune in and, and become a better listener, a harder worker, and more in tune with our neighborhoods and communities instead of taking a sort of a look uh, from above and 
you know, kind of being commanding and, and not making the kind of investment that needs to be made in these neighborhoods and communities. Because our biggest problem is we are highly democratic in this country, but a lot of people sat on their hands. They did not vote. They didn't come out. There are a lot of people that should have voted in my own community as well. And even in the Latino community, when I get from Democrats and Democratic leaders, what's wrong with your community? Why don't they come out and vote? It's a real problem you have to resolve. And I say no. It's a problem you need to resolve. Because it isn't just about me. It's about you, the party, and everyone recognizing that people who are not voting is every one of our problems. We have to change it. We've got to make it happen. And I'm not going to allow you to, to put it on my lap, particularly when we don't have the resources necessary. So my party's got to get into gear. We're going to have to kick it into gear to be much more attentive and to be successful in the future. And I, again, I'm positive. I think it can be. Please join me in thanking um, Gloria. <laughs> now we want to open it to questions from the audience. If you would uh, raise your hand, uh, maybe stand up if you can, uh, give your name, and then if you could uh, pose a question. Uh, Ms. Molina is here to answer it. Yes, in the blue shirt, <coughs> the blue sweatshirt. Gregorio Chavez, I live here in South Bend, and my question is, would you explain what MELDA means to the group here? I don't think a lot of them don't know that. Okay. MALDEF is an organization that's called the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. It is a group of people, it's a nonprofit organization, Gil, and I have served on the board of directors of MALDEF. And uh, we are the, there, it's a nonprofit that are lawyers, very similar to, um, what's the, and, the the, and, the, and others, that, that we have lawyers that are fighting for the larger issues in our community. They were advocates, we are, uh, we have been involved in the issues of employment, of education, of equality, of civil rights, voting rights. Uh, language rights, all of these kinds of issues, and we fight them all the way to the Supreme Court. Our lawyers are very adept and very prepared uh, on many issues of that sort. And so I always call them, they're the lawyers of our community. Um, and we're very proud of them. I'm very proud to have been a part and uh, continue to be a part of MALDEF. Uh, it started in San Antonio. It's now based in Los Angeles, but we have offices in, in San Antonio. We have offices in Chicago. Uh, and Washington, D.C., and Sacramento, and uh, still trying to work on, I think we have, still might have an office in Atlanta. I'm not sure if it's still there. They might have some participation there. But we're always raising money and uh, trying to get and hire more lawyers. We're preparing ourselves because we're going to have to take a tremendous lead in this whole issue of immigration as it, you know, as it rears its ugly head. Uh, we, we're not sure exactly what to expect, but we're in the process now of putting together those kinds of efforts and trying to raise money to, to get, they don't hire, they don't do individual lawsuits, they don't represent individuals, they represent the larger issues, but they're also going to be involved in making sure that, that uh, as immigrants start dealing with, with the due process, hopefully that there is due process, um, as, as maybe people want to deport them, that they're going to be afforded a lawyer, that we're going to have people in place they're going to be able to go and defend them and be a part of, of representing their legal interest uh, as, as they may face deportation. So that's what MALDEF is. So I call it Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Thank you. Yes, Juan, Yes, <coughs> my name is Juan. Uh, I'm a political defense. Glad to be here. Um, and Gloria, you come from a state with a high Latino population. Very high. Uh, so what advice would you, would you give to the Latina or Latino in a state that's not very populous with Latinos and who has aspirations for office? Is not very popular with what? That, that is a state that's not a high Latino population. Oh, to a state like today? Like Indiana yeah, yeah. or Ohio or Michigan. Um, well, again, uh, I, I think that you have to work on, on issues. Um, you, you know, you can't, you have to, you don't have to be, a, in other words, you can get support for your issues even though you're, there are many non-Latinos who will join with you. You have to build those coalitions. That's what we've been doing for a long time. 
find people who are like-minded and build on those opportunities, uh, I think you're going to find people that are, can be very supportive and look for those opportunities to do that. And hopefully, in, in not just in politics, but in every single opportunity that we have to build those coalitions that are going to start working together to move forward issues where there may be discrimination against Latinos or African Americans or minorities in the state, find a way to work with one another to, um, to create kind of the, the, the energy or the synergy to really make that all work together. Uh, and not look at yourself, oh, woe well, with us, there's not enough of us, we can't do it, or whatever. Um, these are the kinds of states that, um, that again, they're going to be challenging, but if we look at it, there are numbers here. I'm surprised um, seeing all these young women that are attending this high school. I mean, I, I'm sorry, I'm from East LA and kind of myopic about it. I think everybody lives there. Um, and I know we're all over this country. Uh, and it's great to see so many people. I mean, I was always surprised. I, you know, when I went to Chicago and, and had, there were a lot of Mexicans in Chicago, and I said, I always thought there was more. And it is changing. You go now to New York, and there's a large Mexican population in New York, always been Puerto Rican Latinos. And so it's changing, and so we're growing in numbers. But I think what, what you could do in, in states like this, it isn't just Latinos coming together and empowering each other, but building coalitions with each other that have like minded. Um, sentiment and philosophy and are willing to work together on issues and empower each other to move forward at that. And keep in mind that, again, your identity is very important uh, and the leadership is very important. But at the end of the day, like anything else, you've got to work with what you have. You, you've got to strategize. It's still important. The issues of educational opportunity are important here, employment opportunity are important here. Um, discrimination goes on here. You've got to fight those issues and you've got to fight, find those people. So that would be my advice, is that don't be forsaken by it. It's not until, oh, we're going to wait till we get enough of us rounded up and then we're going to charge. Uh, no, you're going to, you're going to build a coalition of people who are like-minded on those issues that you want to hopefully bring about change for. And, and not to despair because you're going to find that there are many people who are like-minded who are willing to do that and eventually some of the things will start changing here. Um, but it'll be good to see those faces. I always have believed very strongly that we really have to do a lot of positive affirmative action in every single way. We as Latinos need to have those positive affirmations that are out there that we see people in positions of power because that way it's attainable, you know. Somebody has to break through. You know, when we see um, Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor, that is an empowering feeling. When we see the, the Castro brothers that are so powerful in, in, in D.C., and one is in Congress and one is the head of HUD, that, that's, very impo that's very important. Or when we see, you know, even in entertainment, you know, folks that are moving up and doing well, all of these kinds of things are positive affirmations. It assists us in, in the self-confidence that we should have, that we're in positions that we can do all of these kinds of things. And so we do need to promote each other in that regard because those are positive affirmations that we need. And even people like myself need to be reminded that we are capable of doing everything, anything. We want to do, and it's great to come here to the Midwest to this university and see so many Latinos and Latinas, and to see as professors and, and to see so many and and tackling this issue of Latino leadership, it's significant and it's very impressive to me. So do not despair that there's not enough of you yet. There are like-minded people that are going to move forward many of those issues. Thank you. Another question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. For Certainly. So you talked a little bit about the future of the Democratic Party, and we saw the split uh, during the last election between the Senator Sanders camp as well as the um, Secretary Clinton camp. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the potential art of coalition building, uh, both within our own party and trying to reach across, and still standing by traditional liberal issues uh, that young people like myself have a tendency to both believe in and fight for? <coughs> well. Um, again, uh, okay, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, I'm not going to buy into the fact that the Democratic Party is, quote, the Liberal Party, because I don't know what that means exactly. 
Um, it's a progressive, it can be progressive. It is, it is always been on the right side of civil rights issues, been on the right side of the issues of minorities and, and women and things of that sort. Um, but I don't know what, what we, when we say liberal, what that means. Um, because, but it does, it does need to reimagine itself and redesign itself to understand clearly that we're leaving young people behind. And, and unless we engage young people, we are a party that is going nowhere because the aging population, the leadership of, of, of the party as it's aging is, is not listening and not inclusive um, of those voices. And it should be very telling that even though Bernie Sanders is an old guy, <laughs> it has nothing to do with age. He was able to embrace those issues that were very significant to young people and important to them. Uh, and hit at them on a regular basis. Now, I am one that looks at him, and again, I'm keeping my, this is a battle I have with my daughter. My daughter supported Bernie Sanders, which is very discouraging to me as a lifelong <laughs> Democrat and as a Hillary supporter, which was, so we have this battle on going. Is it, with all due respect to Bernie Sanders, some of his issues were not implementable, if that is such a word. I mean, how do you pay for it? How do you do it? I mean, I love the idea of having free college for everyone, but how do you do it? How does that work and how does that function? He didn't have that all figured out and all planned out and things of that sort. We had enough to do in working and getting uh, the Affordable Care Act. I was a part of when Hillary was trying to move that forward and the compromises that were made with the Affordable Care Act. Whereas, you know, I'm trying to do a single payer system and let's change it today and we want this. Those are nice demands, but in, it, can it be done? And so I guess he spoke to many of you, including my daughter, who thought that change is so automatic. If you just say it, it will happen. That's not the way it works. You've got to walk through a compromise after compromise after compromise. You know, Obama did not get everything he wanted in Obamacare. We still didn't have price controls. We just didn't have, we still had to acquiesce to so many principles that were just not going to make this work. He knew that it wasn't perfect. Uh, and it had to be, con and, and hopefully with Hillary being elected, we're going to make it better and more effective. So um, the issue is, is that my party has to become and, and listen to young people and find a way to encourage them to be a part of the core of the party. Thinking out the vision. I'm not saying that those progressive ideas are not, but they have to work and they have to function. You can't be against Wall Street completely. You know, you've got to find out how to regulate it, how to maintain it, how to, it isn't just taking those positions. But I do think that, that we have, I mean, there were mistakes that were made in the campaign very clearly, obviously. Uh, there were a lot of things as the campaign was rounding itself up that even I had concerns about and issues about. I think it, it's wedded too much to special interest. It spends too much time thinking we've got to raise money, we've got to raise money, and not getting back into the grassroots approach, engaging communities and participating on a local level. Uh, so it's got a long ways to go. But I'm not going to say that, that as young people who want these liberal issues, and I don't know what that is, it's not until you get into the thick of dialoguing with the opposition party and trying to get something passed and legislate those things, the compromises that need to be made are tough. Trying to figure out how to finance things is even harder. Trying to implement legislative changes are very, very difficult and a very stubborn bureaucracy. So things just because you want them to be are not going to be. And those are the lessons learned. And certainly as a young person, I was much more idealistic. I, I, I didn't lose all of it, but I, I learned along the way uh, that you've got to govern. And so I, I tell people I'm a progressive uh, when it comes to, to um, social issues, um, very, very progressive. But as, as, um, as someone who's been involved in government, I'm a fiscal conservative. I am the biggest type one. I'm anti-tax. I really am. Uh, I, I am really concerned about how we spend our money. 
how we don't monitor how we, the accountability for our money. And I don't want to just create programs that just we can't figure out how to pay for them down the line. Um, I, I was criticized by labor unions because they wanted a very generous pension plan. I took it and I mapped it out financially for the next 50 years and I'm going, you're going to break us in the county. We cannot do this. And they said, oh, come on, Gloria. We want this. We work for this and all of this and you've got to treat you know, our retirees and so on. And I am one of the few and I fought hard in my county. Um, there's something called 3% of 50. Um, it's hard to think that you could, you, well, anyway, it's a very generous retirement program that my county did not accept. And I was the lone person. I even had conservative members and one of the liberal members supporting it. And I said, I'm going to campaign on this issue because you're going to bankrupt the county of LA today. You look at places like Stockton, like Orange County, like places like Huntington Park that pass these things, they have over 70% of their general fund budget paying for pensions. That means that they are not raising enough money in, in the, to, to maintain it. So we have to be, we have to watch those things. We have to be careful. So that's what I'm saying. You could be liberal on, on various issues, but you've got to make things work. If Bernie Sanders would have been elected, I would like to have seen how he was going to pay for a free education, college education for everyone. He never did talk about that part of it. Oh, don't worry, we're going to work those things out. Uh, you know, a single payer. Oh, don't worry, we're, we're going we're gonna to work those things out. I didn't buy it. Um, Hillary was, of course, too detailed. I mean, I remember, you know, explaining too much. Uh, but she was a powerhouse in those debates. She knew what she was talking about because she's been involved in governing and responsible kinds of things. But, I mean, I'm kind of biased because I really think highly of her as a policymaker. But our party is going to have to get find a way to reach out to you, liberal ideas, young, and get you involved enough so that you're going to learn how tough it all is, that it is idealistic. I'm not saying you lose your ideals and your vision, but you've got, you've got to be pragmatic. You've got to be practical as to how to succeed. Uh, it's just like, you know, we, Obama could have been, President Obama could have introduced, and Hillary did try, by the way, to introduce, this is what we want in a health care bill, doing all of these things. Well. Not everybody was buying it. Even conservative Democrats were not buying it. So they had to compromise all along the way. The package is not as perfect, and we knew that from day one, hoping to perfect it down the line. Um, but if you look at it, what's so interesting about what, what happened then, who would have thought 10 years ago or 15 years ago that today we would be talking about how to preserve and protect health care for everyone? That was sort of an unknown, and many of us who've been around for all of these years. So those elements, so idealistic kind of things, are really positive things. So today, you know, he's saying repeal uh, Obamacare and replace, but at least they're saying replace. The problem is they don't know what to do because it's the best they're going to get in this compromise. And it, yet it's not perfect. It doesn't meet everyone's needs. We have a long way to go. But we moved a little in the direction. So to have, I mean, what's going on in the LGBT community? Who would have thought that in you, in this dialogue, again generated by a very very aggressive community and from young people who have understood how to come together on many of these things, they don't see those kinds of barriers that we elders in the past have looked at. They they dialogue very differently, so it's a very acceptable kind of thing. Those are the good things that are going on. So they've got to they've got to embrace themselves, and I think that that we need to build on that. And there'll always be a conservative party, and there will always be a different party. And within our framework, we're going to have different levels of liberal and conservative within our Democratic Party. But I do hope that we continue to fight for opportunities, for civil rights, for working families, for working men and women. Um, that's a party I want to be known in. And if those are liberal ideas, okay, they're liberal ideas. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's, you know, those are the things that we care about, the environment and moving those forward. Again, I don't know that we're ever going to get free college education for everyone, but certainly uh, bringing down the cost of colleges, creating opportunities so that students are not 
burden with the kinds of loans that they have to take out now, nowadays in order to get through college. That's an absolute punishment. You know, I'm a big supporter of Elizabeth Warren, and if you read her book, she's right, we're losing our middle class. That is something we should care about a lot. Uh, and it's not a liberal idea. That's a very significant part of our well-being for the future. <coughs> And there are things that we need to do, that, that we need to harness the energy of people who have that vision and who see those kinds of things and bring about those changes. But I think that each of you have to make a decision about how you're going to participate politically. I hope that you're not going to walk away if you were someone who was disappointed in the party and disappointed that, uh, and that's what I've done with my daughter, has challenged her. I said, you know, your candidate didn't, didn't become the Democratic nominee, but you had to vote. Uh, she had a lot of issues uh, on Hillary uh, and, and voiced them to me pretty regularly, but um, she needed to vote and she needed to participate. And I challenged her now to continue to participate and not just leave it behind. It wasn't a one-time shot. You've got to participate and be an active participant and you need to choose how you're going to participate. Uh, so that's what I would say to many of you. Uh, so it's a two-way street. Uh, the party has to come down and meet with and, and People like yourself and others have to step up and, and talk to the party loud and clear uh, of what, what the expectations are, because they, sh they should meet your needs. I would hope they would. Thank you, Gloria Malvina, for being with us. <laughs>